Hey everybody, this is Seth Williams from the RE Tipster Podcast and retipster.com. And I've got a really cool interviewee here today. His name is Josh Brooks. And Josh is a name that I have seen around the various land investing forums and Facebook groups over the past couple of years now as somebody who has just like always been very uh, willing and able to contribute lots of value to other people, like answering questions and throwing out lots of good ideas. And from what I can see, we're going to get into a little bit more in just a minute, but he seems to be very active, doing lots of deals with a lots of experience and somebody who's just very innovative and can sort of figure out how to work through obstacles and figure out his own way to make this business work. So Josh, how you doing, man? I, I'm great, Seth. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. Um, so for those who don't know who you are, why don't you just quick give us your backstory? How, how long have you been in the land investing business and how did you come into this? Yeah. Um, so I've been doing, uh, our style of vacant land, real estate investing, um, for about three years. I, I had some success, uh, during the, the bubble of 2004, 2005, um, where I bought land and was able to sell it very quickly uh, for a profit. So that kind of set the hook in me. But um, I just left a 20 year career in the army uh, and the army kind of took, you know, that and being married took a lot of time and attention. So I, I didn't get to pursue vacant land, real estate investing the way I wanted to. Um, but over the past three years, I've gotten back into it and I've gradually taking it from a part-time or weekend endeavor um, to a, to a full-time thing where now that I'm retired, we're going to um, do it full-time and kick it into high gear. Awesome. Very cool. So did you first learn about it from like back when you do it in 04, did you just kind of like randomly decide to buy a, a piece of land or did you like learn about a specific strategy to acquire that first one or because I, I didn't really know of anybody who was talking about this back then. It's kind of interesting yeah. that you were doing it that far back. So it, it was completely accidental. I was looking for a piece of land uh, in my hometown um, to buy, you know, uh, a young officer looking for a piece of land, maybe build a house on it one day, something like that. So I bought, um, it was like two and a half acres of riverfront. And I think I got it at 42000 I bought it through a realtor off the MLS. And um, about six weeks later, the same realtor called and said, hey, uh, I've got an unsolicited offer, 66500 And uh, do you want to, you know, do you want to make, what, 15 grand after all this stuff happens? And I said, heck yeah, why not? That's That sounds like a great idea. And then um, that kind of was the the blind luck that got me into it. The second big deal back in that day was uh, – 10 acres of waterfront from a guy who was getting divorced. Um, and, uh, you know, you buy 10 acres at a certain price per acre and then you cut it down into four, two and a halfs mm -hmm. and you can sell it at a different price per acre and you're still at a lower price point. So it's available to a bigger market. Um, so there was the, I call that one, the, the, the toilet paper example if you go to Walmart and buy a brick of toilet paper, you're going to pay, you know, three cents a roll or whatever. But if you go to a gas station, you try and buy one roll of toilet paper, you're going to pay three bucks a roll. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's use that arbitrage opportunity. Let's buy in bulk and sell individually. Um, and then the third one was um, I bought a quarter acre for 65,000 off of, Pensacola's multiple listing service and had it relisted for 135,000 on Emerald Coast's multiple listing service. And if you know anything about uh, this area, Pensacola is a uh, port town, Navy town, tourist town. Um, Emerald Coast is Fort Walton, Destin, uh, Highway 30A. So it's more tourist and it's more high end tourist. So mm -hmm. So there was this, and the overlap is where this lot was in between where these two, uh, these two different, um, associate realtor associations happen. So you buy off the cheap or the, the lower socioeconomic, the, the, the 
association out of the lower socioeconomic area and you relist it on the higher, we had it under contract at 105 before we closed on the buy. So, so I had some really big hits back in 04. And then I said, well, you know, the next step in any real estate investors strategy is to, is to go into residential. And uh, <laughs> at the, at my height of that terror and turmoil, I had uh, like 15 units or 15 structures, 22 units, 30 toilets, you know, 30 air, air condenser compressors and, Oh, it's a nightmare. I don't ever want to go back to that again. <laughs> You're managing horrible. all that yourself? You know, I had property managers, but... Um, Still had to pay the cost though, right? And, and nine out of 10 property managers aren't managers. They're go-betweens. Hey, the toilet broke. What do you want to do? Well, I want you as the property manager to solve that problem. That's uh -huh. what that 10% is for. But mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's what happened. And then 10... 12, 13, 2013, I was tooling around on eBay. I told you I, I used to like to do arbitrage on eBay. And uh, I picked up a couple of quarter acre lots down in um, Lee County, Cape Coral, for like 7,500 each. And um, uh, flipped one for 16,000. And the other one is still performing to this day, knock on wood, in my seller finance portfolio. We got... Um, Two thirty nine down on that one. Two thirty nine a month for ninety nine months. So bought at seventy five hundred and seller financing that one out for twenty four grand. Sweet. Was that the um, was that the first seller financing deal you you did, or have you done a lot of that prior to then? That was my first one. Okay. What what did you use? I guess. And have you been doing seller financing much since then? Um, yes, we built. So I've built a seller financing portfolio for us of about 70 properties. Wow. Um, and then I have an investor and we've got about 19 properties in, in their seller financing portfolio. And then um, uh, I was helping a, a, a new investor named, uh, his name's Peter Toth. Um, he, I was helping him along and we have sort of, converged and now are really kind of working in a partnership. And uh, before we kind of partnered, I was working for him. He was the investor and I would be the real estate investor, you know, the, the expert or whatever. Um, and I got him one that's a, a really nice deal too. So I've got like probably, I don't know, 80-ish on seller financing. Okay, cool. How did you guys find each other? Just out of curiosity. He heard... Uh, the podcast on Nick Loper and oh, he sure. read, uh, he read some of my posts in success plant, which is, you know, Butala's, uh, sure. or now it's called land investors. Mm -hmm. So Butala's forum, which is a really helpful resource. Yeah. And, uh, he reached out to me and we had the typical phone conversation and, and hit it off. And we've been, we've been pretty tight since then. Awesome. Yeah. I think I've gotten uh, a number of emails from him. If, if he's the guy I'm thinking of, I think I, know who he is. He loves, he loves your podcast. He won't stop talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. So, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize you guys were connected. So it's good. Yes. To hear. So the, the thing about it is now he came from, uh, he lives up in Edgewater, New Jersey, which is just across the Hudson from Manhattan. And he was a, uh, he was in medical insurance, you know, in, in a big, strong background in sales. Mm -hmm. So he came to me with all of the business acumen, all the negotiations, all of the creative and adaptive thinking, right? All I had to teach him was the land business, or at least what I know of it. Yeah. And um, so at this point now, he's kind of the dispositions guy. So he sells them, and I'm the acquisitions guy. And what a relief that is to have to yeah. stop worrying about selling property. All I have to that's, do is go find it. That's actually kind of an amazing partnership. That's really, really cool. It's great for both of you guys. Yeah. So a couple questions based on what you just said. So seller financing, what kind of, uh, what are you using to manage payments and how has that been? Like, have you had many people who have stopped paying you and flaked out? Has that been a common thing for you or what has your whole experience been like generally with that? Okay. So we, we like seller financing as much as we like cash deals. Right, I'll take it either way. You can you can send it to me in uh, in in anything but Bitcoin or Wampum. The seller financing, the way that we manage it right now, and it is 
admittedly not the most efficient is PayPal. And uh, uh, many of your listeners will say, well, hold on a minute. PayPal doesn't do real estate. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I got a PayPal account. I called PayPal. I said, this is what we do. I'm selling land. I'm selling it on installment. Can I use PayPal to take payments? And two times for two of our companies, they've said yes. And we've never had a knock on wood. We've never had a problem with PayPal. Uh, the way that it works is we, in all of our contracts, we say payments are due on the 10th, late on the 21st. And there's, a, of course, a late fee. So about half of our people pay before the 10th. If they haven't paid by the 10th on the 11th, we send them an invoice through PayPal. And that, that takes care of it, most of it. And, so this uh, payment is not being automatically withdrawn. They have to like manually make the payment, right? Right. So okay. now that, here, here's, here's a philosophical question for you. Would you rather get 12 or 24 payments and have someone default or would you rather them take the property to term and have to give it away? The, the point I'm trying to get at is if someone pays me cash a hundred percent of the time, I have to give them the property. I have to deed them the property. Mm -hmm. If someone enters into a seller financing agreement with me, the best, best estimate right now, 30% of the time, I'm not going to have to give them the property, but they're going to pay me a lot of money. Mm, sure. So, so while I want people to perform and I want to give them the property that they want because they paid me in full, um, you know, one, one way to think about it is we're all grown adults. And if you don't perform on your obligation, I'm happy to take your money and keep my asset. Mm -hmm. So um, we've kind of said, Hey, listen, you're responsible for making your payment. I'm not going to Zelle or Moon Clerk or Schmoop or any of these other payment processors and doing something automatic because, you know, big boys and girls, you can deposit it in our Wells Fargo account or you can send it to me via PayPal. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being courteous on the 11th. If you haven't paid, I'm nice enough to send you an invoice. And we've had a lot of debate about that. And I don't necessarily feel that way all the time. Sometimes I think we should be on automatic payments, but uh, we're almost to the point to where the manual process that we're using right now is unmanageable. I mean, every month it's like pulling our hair out, making sure everybody paid. Yeah. So it, 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 we, we get stressed out counting money. Yeah. I mean, sure. So <laughs> first that it? problems, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so um, PayPal. And then what was your other question? I'm assuming you probably had this conversation a long time ago now, but um, if you recall at all, when you were explaining to PayPal what you were doing when they said it was okay, do you remember how you explained that? Like, did you, cause I, in my comment, I've actually had my PayPal account shut down because I was using it to accept payments uh, on real estate. And then I was forced to sign an affidavit saying I'd never do it again before they would activate my account again. Mm -hmm. but like they were very clear with me that is not acceptable, but I'm wondering a lot of times, like if you just use the catch all term real estate, that means something different than if you talk about vacant land. And maybe if you're talking about like, I don't know, selling something free and clear, maybe that changes something. If you're not using the title company, maybe that changes something. Do you recall, like what, what did you tell them that made them okay with it? So I don't remember the exact discussion cause it's been a couple of years, but, but what I do remember is the guy got off the line and he came back on and he said, okay, these are, it's all vacant land. You're not selling any houses. That's correct. All right. I'll be right back. And he came back on and said, okay, you, this isn't a rent payment. People aren't living there. I said, no, it's vacant land. It's mm -hmm. vacant land and it's an installment contract. And for some reason that hmm. apparently the two times I attempted it made a difference. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, I, I don't think I ever explained it that clearly when I had my issue. So maybe that's the key differentiator to know about if people are ever trying to do this with PayPal. The other one is, um, I set up, you know, of course you incorporate LLC, go get a corporate bank account. And then I, I try, I set up a business bank account with PayPal. Mm -hmm. So that, that might be the difference too. <laughs> if folks are trying to do this, you know, if, if new folks are trying to do this with a personal PayPal account, maybe that's the no, no, I'm not sure. All right, cool. No, that's, that's all great to know. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, Cause I know that's a, to be able to do that with something as easy as PayPal is like huge. Like if you could really do that sustainably and get away with it and without breaking any rules. So that's uh right. We don't want to break rules, but also PayPal is really cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, and it's ubiquitous. Everybody knows PayPal. 
Yeah. And um, a lot of times when people say, well, how do I know you're not going to take my down payment and run away? Well, I'm going to send it to you through a PayPal invoice. You're protected by their buyer protection. Sure. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that eBay does that and, uh, and I do that and it's the same, same. Oh, it's the same as eBay. It is. It's the same security. Cool. Send me the link. Mm -hmm. Sure. Cool, man. That's awesome. From what I gather, given that you have that many deals actively on seller financing, I take it you do a lot of deals per year. Is that, do you do like 50 a year or hundred or a dozen or how many, how many deals are you actively doing these days? We did, I'm very proud of last week. We did three. Nice. I'd like to do three a week forever, mm -hmm. but that's last week was a good week. Yeah. Um, last year we probably did between 50 and 75 deals. Okay. That's awesome. It's a great yeah. job, man. And is this all, all these leads are just coming from direct mail or is there any other special way you're finding these opportunities? Really direct mail is our primary, our primary method. We've had success in the past in, uh, in Butala's free book, and I say Butala, I don't know if he's Jack or Steve today, but I'll just call him Butala. Sure. Um, that ebook he sends out, uh, chapter two is do the Craigslist example, uh -huh. you know, th throw an ad up saying buying property, paying cash. Um, I bought one that way. I've bought one, uh, what I call bottom feeding, which is going to um, uh, land and farm or Zillow or Trulia or one of these and finding a property that has been on the market forever. Mm -hmm. and, and sending a one page letter, kind of a letter of intent. Hey, I'm interested. Uh, I'm interested at this price. If you and your seller are receptive, let me know and we'll put together an offer mm -hmm. and you send out, you know, a hundred of those and you get a, a lot of nastiness, but you get some gold in there too. Mm -hmm. So is that a lot of manual work to like hand pick these out of a website and try to find as opposed to just like downloading a list and sending out like a mail merge uh, set of offers to people? It, it is, but um, you know, we, I think we go through phases as vacant land investors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that, that new phase where I'm scared and, and I'm just want to get my first deal. And then once I get my first deal and I've got a little bit of confidence while I'm waiting for those letters to get out there, and the offers to come back, what do I do in the meantime? Well, I can bottom feed or I can, you know, uh, try inbound marketing on Craigslist or whatever. So, and, and then at some point, um, uh, you know, it stops being new and shiny and wonderful and it becomes a, a business. And, and then you start to move toward ideas of sustainability. And for that reason, I've kind of moved away from bottom feeding and, and, uh, and uh, Craigslist inbound marketing or whatever, because for us, direct mail is the way to consistently, predictably obtain the properties that we're looking for. Yeah. Cool. What, uh, what kind of resources are you using to like get your lists and send out your mail? Like what, uh, what are your favorite tools to use? I like agent pro 24 seven. I have a gal in India who scrubs our data for us. Okay. She does great work. I, I trained her uh, with, with, through a series of videos. And then um, we use Letterstream. Land Academy has that 54 cent um, marketing mail. Yeah. You, can't, you can't beat that mm -hmm. yeah. in terms of price and, and ease. I mean, just upload it, hit the button, it's gone. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> For years, we, you know, I was buying stamps off eBay and we were printing letters at Office Depot and folding them ourselves. And, oh man, it, but you have to go through that, uh, you know, for all the, all the new real estate investors that, that listen to this podcast or, or whatever, you know, that's, that's part of the development is if you don't write a hundred hand addressed envelopes, then you don't appreciate mail merge. And if you don't fold and stuff and seal, you know, a thousand letters, then you won't appreciate letter stream and so on and so forth. I think I've done that on two occasions, if I remember right. And both times I did it, like it chewed up an entire weekend. And for, for me, like I had actually already done a couple campaigns through click to mail. So like I knew how easy it was, but I was just curious, like, would this change my response rate or something? And if there's a real stamp on it and if it looks more personal and and I, I didn't see any real notable difference. And just, I was just so numb after doing that. I mean, it was just, it almost killed me having to do yeah. that all manually. And 
yeah, I agree. Once you sort of have done that, if you yeah. feel the need to do that, it's, uh, it's easy to never look back once you find something better. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, to, to, to speak to your notion of response rate, it's not just response rate, but it's time and quality of life and, and the other non-financial goals that we are trying to pursue as vacant land real estate investors. Mm-hmm. I don't want to spend all my time at the, at the kitchen table folding letters. Yeah. Right. I want to go pursue my leisure goals or, you know, take a walk with my dogs or, or take my wife to lunch or what, whatever. A lot of people say, well, handwritten addresses get opened more and one page letters get opened less. And look, it works until it doesn't. And just instead of spending time, a B testing, this is my opinion, instead of spending time, a B testing and, and trying tracking metrics and all that sort of stuff, Take all that time you would have done an a- analyzing and send out another mailer. That's, that's the way to get ahead is to mail and to mail and to mail more. I know what you mean. Like but there's always an argument for doing something the other way, you know, and it, you sort of have to uh, not to say there's no validity to other arguments. I mean, there's always some other reason why something else will work, but I think it's sort of like uh, finding what works for you and finding something that you're satisfied with the result and then just like plugging away, just like going to town and just kind of ignoring, like choosing to ignore other opportunities because you found something that you're satisfied with. And um, a lot of times I, I think there's just a lot of energy that can get burned up just trying to think about all the what ifs and all the other possibilities. And I don't know. I guess I agree with you is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, you know, let me talk out of the other side of my mouth for a minute. It works until it doesn't. We started off with the, the land Academy two page letter, the cover letter that's nice and builds rapport and then the purchase agreement behind it. And, um, that worked. And when it started not work, we looked at a one page letter that we composed. We sent that out and that started working. And when that stopped working, we went back to the two page and now we actually, um, one of Podolsky's guys, uh, we got a, a letter from him and it's a one pager and we, we modeled our most recent one pager off of it because it, it was nice. It said, you know, cash offer to buy your land. Here's the information and it's, you know, here's the description and five ways to get a hold of me, you know, and that's working now. And we're yeah. going to use that till it stops working and then we'll figure out what to do next. Instead of curiosity, how do you know that it's the copy of the letter that's making it work or not work? Like, could it be the way you're filtering your list or just time of the year or the county where you work in? I mean, how did you narrow it down to that one variable? Exactly. Exactly. We've put um, a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out if that is the one variable. And Seth, I don't know if it is or not. Um, Here's another one to kind of bend your noodle. I have a theory that um, January, February, and March are slow months for real estate acquisitions. I I, I don't know that for sure. Uh, You know, next year, if we have a slump in January, February, and March, I'm going to say, you know what, we're taking January, February, and March off, and we're going to hit it again in April. Because that happened this year, that happened last year, but I'm not sure, was it the time of year, or was I using the wrong mailer, or did I pick the wrong counties? You can really burn up a lot of time and mental energy worrying about these things honestly like you could be right maybe it is the time of the year but maybe it's only in that particular market like maybe on the other side of the country that time of the year has nothing to do with it right. so yeah it, it's one of those things like i i see that you know from time to time people will email me and say you know i sent out all these letters and you know my response rate isn't very good i didn't i didn't get any deals out of it what's wrong it's like man <laughs> like there, there is really no like one right answer to that question. And even if there is like, I don't know that I can figure it out. I can list out a bunch of different things that could play into it, but like, I don't just have the the magic bullet that's going to fix it. Like I can't just tell you change this one thing. It's going to work. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, I think once you, once you have 20,000 letters out the door, then you can begin to get a sense of, okay, this campaign did better. Why this campaign didn't do so good. Why? And there are some simple questions you can ask because people out call me and ask me the same questions. And it's like, okay, I think my mailer flopped. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Did you get a bunch of hate mail and hate calls back? No. Okay, then then for some reason, it, it, well, we, at that point, we know it wasn't price, mm-hmm. right? 
Because if, if, if the only thing, if you did everything else right and just offered too low of a price, you're going to get a hate mail response. Did you get a lot of accepts? Yes. Well, maybe your price was too high. Let me read your copy. If it's the standard copy, you can't really go wrong. Uh, when did you send it? What time of year? You know, what location? You know, it's, it, there's a lot of variables and it, it, again, it can be difficult to troubleshoot. This is the other thing is um, a lot of it's experimentation. And we have, I'll tell you my secret county, if you promise not to tell anybody else. Sure. <laughs> Mojave County, Arizona is my secret county because I know if I mail to Mojave, I'm going to buy a property, right? And we have other counties like that in, in, in other states where I know I'm going to get a property there just because for some reason that county always works. Yeah. And and there's other counties I've mailed to three times using three different letters with the moon in three different phases and nothing happened. <laughs> and so we kind of don't go back to those counties, you know? Yeah. yeah. I've got, you know, a number of counties that come to the top of my mind as well that kind of work like that. And it's not like for me anyway, they're not like the, the counties that would first come to mind. Like if I didn't know any better, I wouldn't think that these counties get results, but they just do. I think that's a, that's one of the beautiful things about like when you do this long enough, kind of like what you said, when you got 20,000 letters out the door, like inevitably when you take that much action, you have no choice but to learn a lot of things. And especially if you're taking good notes about, you know, which counties performed well and which counties were easy to work in. And like, it's so much more valuable than any education you can pay for is just like doing it yourself. Yeah. Really yeah. kind of feeling the pain of, of a disappointment, you know, of a, of a bad response rate or closure on a particular County, man, there's so many lessons to be learned from that. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and you just said something important as well. It's not just if the phone rings, right. Can you get the information in the County? Is that state easy to close? Is that state easy to sell? Right. I mean, there's some counties I could buy land all day long, but man, is it tough to sell? Mm -hmm. Is it tough to sell? So the other thing I would offer to you is you've got to think about what comes back like gold mining. Okay. So we mail out a bunch of letters and stuff comes back. And I can tell you from my first two years, we walked away from deals that I would be all over today. I would be all over them and they were landlocked and they had title problems and there were all kinds of other challenges. We really like those properties now because we've got, we've gone, we've walked those roads. We've got all that experience. And now I know, Hey, if this property comes back and they know it's mostly jurisdictional wetlands or they know it's landlocked or they know it's uh, got title problems. Number one, we're developing our skill set to fix those problems and unlock value. But number two, on the buy side, I can go back and say, okay, well, I did offer you this much, but that was assuming you had legal access and blah, blah, blah. You don't, it's going to cost me this much. Therefore I can now offer you much lower. And a lot of times they will take it because they've tried to sell it six or seven times. And it always comes back that it's landlocked. And here's a guy that knows it's landlocked and he wants to pay me cash. Yeah. It's not a lot but at least I can dump it. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. Yeah. There's actually, um, I think there's a ton of value and I don't see hardly anybody doing this, uh, narrowing down a very specific niche for the type of land that you're going after. Like I am only going to pursue infill lots or mm -hmm. I'm only going to pursue landlock properties or I'm only going to pursue waterfront and nothing else. I think, you know, there's a bunch of benefits to that. First of all, like it's really easy to, sort your list so that you're only sending mail to those exact properties and you get a lot more familiar with the values of those types of properties in one area. So you kind of know what you're dealing with there. And when it comes time to like building a buyer's list, like you've got very specific buyers on that list who want that type of property. Yeah. Like somebody who wants a 10 acre lakefront lot is going to be very different from somebody who wants a half acre infill lot somewhere. So, just it uh, allows you to streamline a lot of stuff, even your website. I mean, you can tailor that with pictures and copy that's geared exactly at that type of property and that type of buyer, that type of seller. It's, I don't know, it seems like it makes a lot of sense uh, for a lot of reasons. And most of the people that I know, um, they're not necessarily going for like property type necessarily. It's more like I want this value amount in 
that's kind of what I'm, what I'm going for. Or mm -hmm. like, I'll take anything that comes my way. And that can certainly work too, especially if you want to do high volume, but there's also a lot more you have to learn and you just have to know a lot more to be able to reliably value a lots of different types of properties in different areas. If we truly want to be vacant land real estate investors, don't we want to know all that stuff? You know, so, so I understand what you're saying. There are people that go after one specific niche of property. One of the reasons why we're able to do so many deals, and frankly, one of the insights that we've discovered is that problem properties have higher margins because you can buy them for really, really crazy, crazy prices. But, but one of the reasons we do so many deals is because it comes in and from a perspective of the joy of learning, we say to ourselves, how can we buy this property in a way that's helpful to the seller, profitable to us and of value to the person that buys from us. And um, we know things now that, that have made us empowered. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. We recently bought 22 acres that uh, the seller um, had tried to sell several times. She didn't know if there was access or not. She thought there might be, I got it tied up under contract for, I think, 27000 paid a consultant to look at it. The consultant said, yeah, I think there's access, but you need a survey. Hired a survey company, paid them 2200 bucks to draw the survey. Guess what comes back on the survey? Access easement. Well, okay, so we're in the clear, right? Not exactly, because there's an easement there, but it's not deeded to us. So mm -hmm. there's access, but it's not deeded access. And you get the lawyer involved and, and learning about all the different apparent easements and necessary easement and subordinate parcels and easement by necessity and all of the options. And, uh, you know, we're gearing up to go to court to get an easement by necessity. It's going to cost us another 10 grand or whatever. But um, before that happened, we sold the property for $82,500, you know, and we were into it for 30. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what was the, what was the true value that we got out of that deal? The money, that was nice. But the knowledge about, I didn't know about easement by necessity. Basically, there is no such thing in Florida. If you're willing to go to court, there's no such thing as a landlocked property. Yeah, can force it. You can force it. Now, it, the process is long and painful and expensive, but when you're dealing with you know, a 22 acre property that's got that that's probably worth 105 or 110,000. Um, you've got the margin to do that. And so, and, and we're working on another one right now, 80 acres that doesn't have legal access. And I think, I think it's worth 150 and, and we're buying it below 50 mm -hmm. and put on the budget, a line item, $10,000 easement by necessity. Once mm -hmm. we get that unlock the value. Yeah. That's, so. That's fascinating. Yeah, I've actually tried to explore that with some of the landlocked stuff in, in Michigan and a lot of differing opinions I've heard around here about how that works. And what I found is that it's, that's actually not a thing, at least in the areas when I've been working here in Michigan. But mm -hmm. I think that's, again, one of those things that varies from state to state. And if you can do it, wow, that's, that changes a lot of things for you know, the prospects of what, what landlocked pro uh, properties are worth and whether or not they're worth going after. So yeah, again, it kind of comes down to like, like opportunity cost. Like, what are you saying no to through your decision to spend the time and the resources to put this easement in? I mean, is it worth it? Sounds like it's like kind of a no brainer to me if this all works out. But again, like, I don't know how many deals are we missing out on because we're spending our time over here instead of over there. And like, I don't know that there is an answer to that. Like, cause you can't, you can't relive the same moment twice. There's no way to know, but uh, it's worth thinking about, especially if you know you're really good at finding deals in a particular market. You know exactly what buttons to push and how to get there, but you don't really know what you're doing in this other realm and you're kind of figuring it out. But uh, to your point, I mean, the education you got from that, I'm sure can be multiplied many, many, many times over. I mean, that's worth a lot to understand how to do that stuff. Well, the, the, the knowledge we got from that deal gave us the confidence to go ahead with this next deal. Uh, here's another one. Um, transcription of, of or uh, they, they mixed up um, 
part of the legal description. You know, it should have been the Northeast over here and Northwest West over there and they were backwards. Yeah. So um, this nice lady ends up, she was supposed to get 60 acres out of a, a parent 100 acre parcel in 1972. And um, no one found the error on this deed until we go to buy it from her. And uh, the, the folks that granted her the property are long gone. And so the lawyer's like, hey, it's gonna cost you $5,000 for the quiet title suit. Okay, if we're, if we're buying two and a half acre parcels in Mojave County for 200 bucks and trying to sell them for a thousand bucks, that's a deal killer. But this was 60 acres. I thought the property was worth 100. We were into it for, I think, 50. So there's, there's meat on the bone to get this done. And so we, we went down the road with that attorney and uh, started the quiet title suit. Now, an adjoining neighbor of, uh, bought us out before we finished the suit, uh, bought the contract from us. But I now know that a quiet title suit in that area, I can get it for $5,000 from that lawyer. It's going to take about 120 days. And... Um, here are the things that you've got to ask qualifying questions to kind of have enough information to give the lawyer to go on. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, a lot of vacant land investors are, are going, they're going right on by landlocked land. They're going right on by land with title problems. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I invite your, your audience. If, if you know, you guys have a deal like that on the line, give me a call and let's partner. You know, and I'll show you, I'll show you what we know and, and everybody can win. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, I mean, in the business of land investing, you're really a problem solver. Like this person owns a property, they don't want it or whatever. It doesn't mean anything to them. And the problem you're solving is getting rid of that issue in their lives and giving them cash for it. But you're basically just taking that problem, problem solving a few steps deeper to like really solving a bigger problem and, really being rewarded pretty handsomely for it if you can actually succeed at that. And I know what you mean, man. Title, title issues can be like very intimidating, especially if you, don't, if you don't really understand the intricacies of title work and how complex and complicated it can be and how to you know, go back in time and, and retroactively resolve issues that were created years ago. Like, that's a, like even myself, when I see that, I'm just like, no, I'm doing something else. It doesn't right. sound like fun to me. But if that's like uh, something you've carved out for yourself where you can be really competent at solving those kind of problems, I mean, I don't know. I just, I think that gives you a really strong foothold in whatever market you want to work in. Just in make, terms of make no mistake though. I still like a five acre parcel with a paved road and utilities at the lot and no wetlands and titles clean. I like those too. We'll buy those, yeah. but, but we'll also buy the ones with flawed titles and that are landlocked if the margins are right. So I know you mentioned uh, earlier how, you know, you do a lot of the acquisition stuff and Peter does a lot of the um, selling. Yep. How do you guys get stuff sold exactly? Like where, where are you, what websites are you listing on mom? What's, what's been the most effective medium for you? Okay. So, so um, of course, Landwatch is always uh, a primary seller you know, we've recently made the decision to upgrade to all three land and farm and uh, lands of America. So that's a platform. And then he's had a lot of success recently with um, Facebook. Oh, so cool. he'll, he'll post to Facebook and then drive that traffic to his website, which is uh, Peter sells land.com where all the information is. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's like teaser on Facebook drive it to petersellsland.com. And then he's also trying to capture email addresses to build the buyer's list. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the discussion and the, de the debate right now is what's better. Is it better to pay for Facebook ads or is it better to pay a virtual assistant in India to join buy sell groups in the area where the property is and post that way? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're having a learning experiment there. Yeah. So the success you've had with that so far, has that been with paid ads or has, it, has that been in like swap shops and Facebook groups? I think that, I think the, the buy sell groups are, are the ones that are turning out the deals right now. Mm -hmm. That and of course land watch. Yeah. And uh, in these posts that you're putting out there, 
like, uh, what does a post look like? Is it like a sentence or something? And then a link to the Peter or, uh, like, are you attaching a picture to it or, or what exactly are you doing that actually entices people to click on the link and go learn more? Yeah. Peter's kind of a nut about photographs. He is actually not paid photographers because they went and shot photos on cloudy days. Oh, He's yeah. like, it has to be a sunny day. Mm-hmm. It has to be a sunny day. And by the way, you're not going to get paid if it's not a sunny day. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, uh, the photographs are his, he's a, he's a big fan of photography. And then he uses more of a sort of a, um, a little bit of a description. Imagine your home site here or a little bit realtor a little bit salesy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all the, all the meat and potatoes of the property is on, on the website. You've got a buyer's list, right? He's developing one. Okay. Is that, has that been a, played a big role in your success at selling properties? Do you know, like, is that a big deal yet or not necessarily? No, not, not yet, but, um, he sees the value in it. And this is why he decided to be the dispositions guy. In addition to his ability to sell it and my, my, enjoyment of the acquisition side. He also understands, you know, he's been reading and studying about all of these disposition strategies, buyers lists, Facebook groups, marketing ads, Craigslist, multiple proxies and all that sort of stuff. And I told him, I said, that's you. When I hear about all that stuff, my eyes glaze over Mm -hmm. because before I partnered with Peter, my method of selling was I was an income investor. I had very few cash sales, only when people wanted to buy for cash. Most of the time it was, um, you know, buy a property at 25 cents on the dollar and then, you know, 200 bucks down, 200 bucks a month for 120 months. Mm -hmm. And with a $200 down payment on Landwatch, they're gone in 30 days. You don't have to sell. You don't have to, you don't have to actively market these things for sale. But but Peter is much more of a fan of either he likes a cash sale. Um, he likes a seller finance sale where he gets all of his cost basis down back or at a minimum, he gets all of his cost basis back in like 12 months. Mm-hmm. So therefore he's got to be more active on the uh, dispositions on the yeah. marketing. Um, you mentioned earlier, you've got, you know, a virtual assistant in India. Do you have any other VAs or people who are doing stuff for you? Cause I, yes. I know, I mean, it's a very, very, to, to be doing the volume that you are, I mean, that's an insane amount of work if you don't have any help. So like, what have you outsourced and where'd you find those people? How does that all work? Oh yeah. No, we've got, we've got a team. So be, and it's, it's all about design. I don't want to do anything, but sit down at my desk and look at deals and tell people how to play them. Yeah. Okay. Um, so therefore I need and and there are a couple of things that that nobody can do except for me and i i don't mean that to sound arrogant but in our, in my business there's a couple of things that i want to do mm-hmm. i want to pull the data i want to check the scrubbed data i want to do the valuation i want to do the mail merge cuz that's a great opportunity to do a comprehensive quality control check and then um, I'll send it off to the letter because the letter printing service because that's easy. But Ansi, uh, my my virtual assistant in India, she pulls all the all the valuation data off the of land watch for me. Hey, this this month we're we're going into these six counties. Get me everything between this acre and that acre. I need to feel what what land what the market is on land watch, and she'll shoot it back in a spreadsheet. And that from that I'll do manipulations where I arrive at my my offer price data. I'll pull the data from uh, Agent Pro, send it to her. She'll scrub it, send it back, and and you know I basically gave her some real clear cut instructions. If if this is in this cell, turn it this color. She doesn't delete anything. You know uh, all the all the rows that we don't need to use, turn them gray. Because mm-hmm. you know when Peter and I have discussions about uh, what we're going to offer, because his primary duty is dispositions, but his first secondary duty is my sounding board on the acquisition side and vice versa. Before I send a spreadsheet out, you know, Hey, these are the valuations I'm coming up with. Here's my thoughts. What do you think? Mm-hmm. And he'll, he'll, I leave a, I put a couple columns in for him. He'll add his thoughts 
and we'll have a discussion about it. And ultimately I'll make a decision on, do we want to go with him, me an average or, you know, start over whatever, whatever. Just recently I hired Tammy and Tammy is, um, I told her her job is one third acquisitions manager, one third reaction technician and one third accountability coach. So acquisitions manager, she should be, you know, every month to meet our goals, every month we need to mail this many, every week we need to mail this many. That means I need valuations from ANSI on these dates. I need to send data to ANSI on these dates. I need data back from ANSI on these dates. I've got to do my thing within two business days because if I haven't done it within two business days, it's getting, you know, it's getting old. So she's kind of keeping the process running. The other things she does is when a call comes in, I'll take the call, I'll pass the information to her. And so do you guys, when you send blind offers, do you have some sort of discrete reference number on each letter? I don't do that, but I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so for your audience, those that don't understand or, or haven't done this in the top right corner, we'll do like, this will be like right now we're working on campaign 1805 C. So mm -hmm. 2018, 05 is May is when we pulled the data. C is the third data pull. And then um, we'll assign an alphanumeric code to each and every record. So when they call, I've got their number on my phone, caller ID. The only other piece of information that I need minimally is that reference number. And then I can go back to our data. So what I do is I, it, when a call comes in, I field it. You know, I send it to Tammy. I say, okay, here's the number. Here's the reference number. Here are, you know, they gave me their name. They said the county, but you know, the like six or seven pieces of information yeah. and she'll go and build the pre-marketing due diligence package, tax card, property card, vesting deed, and then aerial shots from Google earth, property appraiser, close in, far out, fish and wildlife, wetlands, which is a big deal where mm -hmm. we buy yeah. and, uh, and FEMA flood zone map. Mm -hmm. And so she can shoot that to me and then I can look at it and go, okay, we have basically have like four, four responses to a due diligence pre-marketing package. We can walk away from it. If it's, you know, a holding pond in a subdivision, walk away. We don't, there's, we would not buy that at any price. There's the notary close also known as the run to the bank we want this one and I want this one yesterday. I'm going to get a cashier's check, draw the deed up. There's the title close. Those are for ones that we want, but the prices are a little steeper. So let me send them a check for 500 bucks and a, a, a revised purchase agreement. I'm going to send it out to them in a priority mail envelope with a return priority mail envelope. They cash the check. They send me the signed purchase agreement. I send it to the title company and voila, it happens. And then the, 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 the other one, and this is one where I talk about, you know, getting back into not letting any opportunity pass us by. I don't like this property at the price on the letter I sent out. Or they called and countered. Hey, you said eight, I want 12. Okay. So what we'll do in those instances is we'll send out an either or offer. A revised, updated purchase agreement, we call it the either or. Either you take my price in 15 days or I'll take your price in 180 days. But it's still subject to due diligence to include a marketability assessment, mm -hmm. which is code for I'm going to try and sell it. And if I can't sell it, that's due diligence that I don't want to buy it. Yeah. Um, and oh, by the way, I'm putting a $100 check for earnest money in there. And uh, or, you know, if, if we pull up the if I pull up the due diligence packet and there's wetlands or flood zone or you know, the road's crappy or, or for a number of other reasons, I can say, well, that offer price, we thought it was a pristine property. It's not, here's some things we don't like about it. And therefore I can offer you this or this, take your pick and drop those in the mail. And we're getting about a 25% success rate on those. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's awesome, man. Yeah. You got this down to a science. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I feel terribly disorganized, but Tammy's helping with that. Mm -hmm. um, but back to your question, ANSI does lots of data scrubbing. Tammy is the acquisitions manager, which allows me to kind of be the free thinker. Um, Julie, my wife does the bookkeeping, Chris, our good friend, uh, and our accountant does the accounting. 
Peter does dispositions. Peter has a, a guy helping him with dispositions. And um, I'll let you know when we're hiring again, Seth, you can come work with us, man. Sweet, man. Yeah, so, just let me know. <laughs> but I, I, in all seriousness, I want a team of about eight or so people and let's buy a property a day and let's, um, let's net uh, five grand off of each property. Mm -hmm. And there'll be plenty of money for everybody. Now, of these people that are working for you, the, the VAs anyway, where did you find them? Is there like a, like, did you go through Upwork or something? Or did you use uh, I got apps? Yeah, I got ANSI through Upwork. I got Tammy by placing um, a job. I put a job on ZipRecruiter and Craigslist and she applied. And it was like a formal, hey, send resume to this address. And I got like 27 resumes and I looked at hers and I was like, holy smokes. She, you know, she... The, the cool thing, it's not cool, but the fortunate thing for us is we're near a military installation here and the economy just doesn't support the kind of talent that the spouses bring with them. Yeah. So we've got a lot of spouses, military spouses around here that are incredibly talented. I mean, this woman was a director of human resources at a accredited institution at their last, their last stop. She ran the HR department of a university. And now she's my acquisitions manager. I feel like I fell in a pot of gold. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it it kind of reminds me, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the website, hiremymom.com. Um, I think it's .com. But it's sort of based on a similar concept of like some incredibly valuable talent uh, is like stay-at-home mothers. You know, they, they went to college, they've had great careers, but for one reason or another, they had to drop out, you know, maybe to be a stay at home mother or something like that. Mm -hmm. So like they, they like to work, but not like on a full time away from home kind of situation, more like a part time, something they can do from anywhere. And uh, there's a lot of talent in that, you know, particular demographic. So that is, I think one of the most underutilized labor pools in the United States yeah. is, is the, the, the smart, talented, hardworking woman who took a career pause to, to start a family and, and, you know, do the homemaker stuff. They still, you know, once they get the kid after, you know, 12 months or whatever, they have four or five hours a day where they want to be in the game. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, I, no, I'm, I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. I, I know you're, you know, you're familiar with all the other land educators out there, including myself and, I know, you know, there's a tendency, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but there's a tendency to kind of like oversimplify the land business sometimes because from a high level, like it is kind of simple, you know, it's a pretty basic concept, but when you actually get into the business, you realize like there's lots of obstacles, there's lots of hard things about this, lots of questions that nobody's going to answer. You got to figure it out for yourself. And I'm just curious from all of your experience, what, what do you think is like one of the biggest misconceptions that people have about the land investing business say they've heard some podcast episode from somewhere and they're like sweet i want to get into land like what do they not actually realize that they need to know before they jump in i know there's a lot of potential answers to this <laughs> well i think i think education is important i have not had a chance to experience your educational product um i would like to do that of the others i i think i mean i got to tell you and I don't get anything from them, but I think Butala's program is, if you're a beginner, that and a lot of hard work will get you some success. Yeah. Um, but the, but the nuances, yeah, it's, it's not as simple as it's not a simple, it's not the equivalent of HGTV. You don't show up and do a little bit of painting and all the, voila, you just rehab the property. It's, it, that is not how this happens. Yeah. Um, I would offer, uh, the recommendation that, you know, if you're going to build, if you're going to come into the vacant land real estate investing space and you're new to it, you need to have, you need to have sufficient capital because it is not a, it, it isn't free. You need to have education and you need to have a mentor or a couple of mentors. You need to find somebody who's got experience who will take the time and talk you through it. Now, I'm not a huge fan of the coaching that's offered by some folks because um, some of that 
is uh, I've heard some horror stories. Uh, one particular guy I talked to said, um, I'm 15,000 into coaching and I haven't done my first deal yet. And I said, I, that does not compute. You should be into your first deal. You know, you, you should pay me a $2,000 coaching fee and I'll put you on your first deal. Like, like 15,000 is abuse. The other thing though is coaching isn't gonna, isn't gonna replace that drive. You've got to, you know, um, I'm thinking about Mal- Malcolm Gladwell and the, the book, The Outliers. In there, there's a chapter about the, the work ethic of Chinese rice farmers. You know, the, the rice will work if you do, is one of their, one of their sayings. And another one of their sayings is, no man who rises before the sun 300 days a year fails to make his family rich. The letters will work if you do. Yeah. Nothing can substitute hard work and nothing can substitute, you know, the pain and suffering of study and learning. And, and you know, so, so in that regard, if you look at this as the, the destination is lots of money, it's going to be a painful go. But if you look at it as the destination is the process, the path is the goal, the, the learning and the discovery. And oh, by the way, every once in a while, the numbers in my bank account go up that's where we are, then you're going to have a lot of fun. The misconception is you have to learn, you have to study, you have to work. Sort of similar to, I remember when I was in college, I went to a pretty rigorous uh, academic school, uh, but it was fun. It was the kind of school where they would let almost anybody in, but their, you know, retention rate for freshmen was very, very low. Lots of people would be gone after the first semester. And you could kind of tell who they were going to be like the first week or two of school. You just know like, okay, that guy's not going to last. Like there's no way. (laughs) Sometimes I I almost sort of feel that way with uh, people who are new to the land business and they send me these emails and just the kinds of things they're asking for and the things that they expect me to do for them. I'm like, dude, if you can't figure this out for yourself, like if you really want me to hold your hand, like this just isn't going to work, you know, I'm sorry. And there's nothing wrong with asking questions. That's not the issue. It's more of uh, this idea of like, people don't realize how much power they actually have. If they're willing to go out there and like bump into a few walls and screw some things up and figure out like, okay, that doesn't work. It's like, they expect it to just work perfectly on the first shot and somehow Mm -hmm. I have this magic touch that's going to make it work for them. And I think it comes down to like the people that I see who make it long-term or they just like start doing stuff. You know, they've got, they've got very, uh, they think big, they make things happen and they don't, uh, obstacles and things like that don't scare them. Like if there's a problem, they just figure it out. Like they push through it and they don't let things hold them back. And those are common attributes I see of people who end up making it long-term. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, it's, I love helping folks. And actually I welcome novel problems, but you know, if you can't get it from the educational product that you bought and you can't get it in one of the discussion boards, and then if you can't get it on Google or YouTube, then call me. Yeah. Right. But, but don't, don't call me. How do I do a mail merge? Well, you mm-hmm. dude, you can teach yourself that at watching YouTube. Yeah. And if you can't follow the instructions on YouTube, then you're not smart enough to be a land investor or do mail merge. Yeah. And, and, you know, I I don't mean to be mean about it, but, but yeah, now if you call me and say, here's the problem, nobody in the forums knows it, that wasn't covered in the instructions. This is a land specific novel problem. Then I want to come and help you with it because um, then I'll know how to do it when I encounter it, if I ever encounter it. Yeah. And those things come up a lot. I know in the, uh, you know, the monthly office hours, webinars I do, there's some people in there that all, ask like really, really good questions. Like it's very clear that they've thought through the issue and even just the way they ask the question, it really helps me to understand what they're dealing with. And questions are great, but it's just about uh, a lot of times there are really easy answers and it would take you like two minutes of looking to find it. (laughs) So I know what you mean. It's kind of frustrating to deal with that sometimes. Well, hey, Josh, I appreciate so much your willingness to uh, get on the horn here with me and talk about what you've been up to and all the things you've learned. I've learned a ton of stuff in this past 60 minutes or so of us talking. So I appreciate your generosity and sharing uh, some of the things that have worked for you. Uh, If people want to learn more about you or contact you, I don't know if you want to offer that up or not, but is there any place they should go to learn more about what you got going on? Yeah, you can, uh, you can hit me on uh, two, four J 
brooks at gmail.com. That's my, uh, one of my direct emails. I'd be happy to answer it. And uh, yeah, again, if I can be helpful to you or your audience, anybody wants to buy land, check out Peter at petersellsland.com. And uh, I really, really appreciate you, Seth, and, and uh, the stuff that you're doing with Ari Tipster. And um, let me know how I can help in the future. Absolutely. Thanks again, Josh. Appreciate it, man. Take care.